Well, it's been several weeks since I was supposed to have preached this message, and either God's shown up or somebody else did, or we've had a variety of reasons. Like, oh, we had snow one week, and our ice, and we didn't even meet, and so my hope deferred message is not going to be deferred any longer, I guess. We're actually going to get around to it today. Thank you, Lord. I had oil all over my glasses, so I... Cheryl's clean them up. Perfect. Thank you. If you would, if you have a Bible with you, turn over to Psalm 105. Psalm 105. We're going to hear a little bit about a guy by the name of Joseph. Any of you ever heard of him? Okay. We're going to tell you all about him there. Hallelujah. Psalm 105, and we're going to go to verse number 16. This is talking about God when it says, moreover, he. So just to let you know who they're speaking about here in verse 16. It says, moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him, the ruler of the peoples, to let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. Father, we praise you this morning for this passage, and we just ask, Lord, that we can discover within this some things not only about Joseph, but that you would have us to know about our lives. I pray that every heart and mind be open this morning, that every ear would hear, and we give you the praise for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. The psalmist here is talking about Joseph. Joseph was a patriarch of Israel. Joseph was the uh, grandson of, actually was the great-grandson of Abraham, the grandson of Isaac, and the son of Jacob, who was also known as Israel. And he was the favorite son, even though probably Jacob wouldn't want to admit that, because he was the first son of his favorite wife. You know, if you know anything about the story, he kind of got, his dad kind of got tricked into uh, having to marry the, the girl he didn't love, and she was producing babies left and right, and the girl he loved wasn't. And uh, he also had a couple of concubines, or they were the servants of the two girls, and and uh, he's having babies left and right with them. But finally, finally his wife gave birth, and she gave birth to Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel after he worked some things out between him and God. Aren't you glad you can work some things out between you and God? Amen. Well, Joseph, if you know the story, he was uh, given to dreams and interpretations of dreams, and he wasn't shy about telling them, and his dreams always indicated that he was going to be a notch above the rest of his brothers, and his brothers didn't really care for that. His daddy gave him a coat of many colors. It was a little different than everybody else's, a little better maybe, and, and they didn't care for that. And finally, they got tired of him, the dreamer, they called him, and they sold him into slavery. Wasn't a very good thing to do to your brother, I don't think, but then he was only a half-brother to them. He has a younger brother named Benjamin, but he wasn't involved in that. So his brother sold him into slavery. He ends up in Egypt. He works in a guy, guy's house named Potiphar, and he does so well that Potiphar puts everything in his hands that he owns. The only problem is that Potiphar's wife wanted to be in his hands too, and uh, he wasn't going for that, so she lied on him. And he ended up in, in jail again, in the prison. And in the prison, he gives an interpretation to a couple of guys' dreams. And uh, he said, now, when you get back, you remind, you let me you tell the king about me and get me out of here. And they kind of forgot about it until the king has a dream. I say king, he was Pharaoh. 
Uh, Pharaoh was a kind of a king, but that's a different title. And Pharaoh has this dream and says, oh, man, none of his guys can interpret it. And finally, the, uh, the uh, cupbearer says, hey, uh, I know a guy. He's in jail. Yeah, I met a guy in jail. You know, I, I got those stories, but you just, you just don't think that, the, you know, the guy sitting next to the king is going to have those stories. But, yeah, oh, yeah, I met a guy in jail. and uh, I'm going to get sidetracked if I start telling those stories. <laughs> oh, I got to tell one, at least one. <clears throat> no, I don't. I'll move on. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell it later maybe. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so, so Joseph goes. He interprets the dream for Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, whew, this guy here, you know, elevates him up, makes him number two in the land. And basically his dream was about a famine that was coming and that we needed to store up and be ready for the famine. And so that's what they did. And when the famine came, it didn't just affect Egypt. It affected the whole uh, Middle East, I guess. And the Hebrews, the Israelites, Israel and his children, were affected by it too. And uh, he sends his sons over to get some grain. And Joseph recognizes his brothers. And he, uh, you know, kind of torments him a little bit. <laughs> Interesting passage there. You kind of wonder how come... How come he did it the way he did? But man, long story short, he ends up revealing himself. His whole family moves over. They're saved. They got food. Glory, hallelujah. And it didn't until Moses, you know, down the road a number of years before the Israelites are on the bottom and they have to get back on the top again. How many know God's good at taking those on the bottom and putting them on the top? Joseph got promoted. He got elevated. Uh, it was better than a big catch of fish. He got the will of God in his life. Now, this little passage here is uh, speaking to a couple of things, kind of a, a synopsis of what happened. And we want to look at this when it comes to the idea that not everything you think is going to happen is going to happen when you think it ought to. How many of you know that sometimes I'm believing for something and it doesn't happen right away? Amen? Now, let me also say that sometimes we're believing for things to happen in other people and the other people have some control in, with that. Amen? Because when you're believing for someone to get saved or you're believing for them to progress spiritually and everything, they have to participate with the plan. God doesn't make us do anything. Have you ever noticed that? Now, he can bear on us real strong, and he can put an emphasis to us, and we can feel like we're not going to be able to escape from it, and we can try, like we said the other, the other week about Jonah, run, try to run from it, but the fact is he's going to hunt you down no matter where you are. You might as well just go with it and let it happen. Well, sometimes... I want things right now, and God says not yet. Amen? And we have to understand that, that uh, delays are not denials. Just because it doesn't happen immediately doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And maybe it's going to happen differently than what you think. And I want us to look at this passage and kind of think about some things in regards to that. And the first thing I want you to think about is that no provision, let's talk about no provision in the bigger picture. You know, for some reason, I think, well, if there's famine in the land, that can't be God. Bless God. I mean, why would God send a famine in the land? Well, it kind of indicates that he did. Amen. Now, in the Old Testament, anything that happened, they kind of blamed on God. In the New Testament, they're kind of a little more generous with him, and they only speak about the good stuff. But uh, my theology says that God can do anything he wants, and if he wants to send a famine on the land, he can. Now, I don't know that he does that all the time. If you talk to people a lot about the United States... You get varying opinions about what's going to happen. Oh, he's going to destroy this nation. We're so evil. And other people say, it's going to be good. People are going to rise up and we're going to take over. And it's going to be, you know, uh, it's going to be victory all the way. I don't know. I, I really don't know what God's plan is. I don't really see a whole lot about it in the Bible. The United States isn't named out exactly. Uh, I don't know what he's going to do with us. I hope that he's going to allow us to continue on as a prosperous nation allow us to continue on. It doesn't look like some of the people who are uh, pharaohs in our land uh, are serving God or have God's interests or are biblically minded, but I don't know. Anything can change. Uh, when economic times uh, are bad, people tend to turn to God. During uh, the, the Great Depression in the 1920s when my dad was a youngster, uh, people turned to God. A lot of people went to church. 
And it's happened before. It'll happen again. People will turn to God. Now, in this particular instance here, it says that he basically destroyed all the provision in the land. Let's read it again. He destroyed all the provision of bread. So they, they were having this famine. It was going on. He says in the first, in verse 16, moreover, he called for a famine. So it sounds like God was behind this. In the bigger picture, you know, in the, in the small picture, I think, well, God, you're not going to withhold anything from me. I'm your child. And I don't know about you, but there's been times I didn't let my kids have everything they wanted. It's not always good for them. Amen. Some of the things we want wouldn't be good for us. But even if it was good for us, it doesn't mean they get it immediately. Amen. Now, I'm not thinking so much that it's behavior-based as it is just something that we sense or know and we, we decide that it's not time or whatever. But sometimes provision is lacking and it's a plan of God. Now, when I think about that, I think, oh, boy. Boy, I could be poor tomorrow then. Well, the truth is, most of us, if we was without a job for six weeks, we'd be already hurting. Three months, we'd be hurting bad. You know, I mean, that's just the way most people live. So it wouldn't take much to have a famine in the land. Amen? I mean, really, for most people, yeah. <clears throat> You know, the word provision means to before to think, to forethought, foreplanning, premeditate, a premeditated plan, making preparation, providing for, provision. And God has a plan. How many believe that? He has a plan, he has a purpose, and he has something that he wants to see accomplished in your life, and it's not always going to be happy. Uh, joy is a fruit of the spirit. Happiness is based on circumstance. Circumstances are not always, you know, always great. It doesn't, it, 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 it. Now, see, I prefer to think everything's going to go well for me and I'm going to be happy all the time. I'm going to have good circumstances. And by and large, most of us can say we probably are. If we were happy people, some of us aren't happy to begin with, you know what I mean? <laughs> you could have all the provision there was and you still wouldn't be happy. In Romans 13, 14, uh, the word provision is used, make no provision for the flesh. There are some things we're not to provide for. We're not to pre-plan for sin, amen? We're not supposed to sit around and meditate on how, oh, you sit and meditate on sin, the next thing you know, you're going to be writing a check. You're going to be trying to figure out some way to bring it to pass, whatever it is. We're supposed to be meditate on the things of God. And we have to understand that sometimes there's a purpose that's bigger than us. If God wanted to teach our country a lesson, will we prosper when everybody else doesn't? Oh, it got real quiet. It's a meditative thought. I mean, would we? Well, let's look at Israel. Let's look at the, the children of Israel. It wasn't so much that they were going without, but their going without brought them into plenty, into a land of plenty. Amen? They went to the land of, it ended up in the land of Goshen, and it was a land of plenty. It was a great place to be at that time. You know, where God takes us from what might happen still is going to be better than what a lot of people have. I mean, honestly, if we look at this particular passage, if it applies in any way to our lives, then we have to say, okay, big picture says it's not good. My picture says, hey, he's got a plan. And if he's got a plan, then that plan's going to be better than what we might think it's going to be. But you have to hang in there. What if the Israelites said, oh, this is, this is too bad, let's just kill ourselves. Let's all go jump off Masada, you know, which they did later. But I don't know if that was God's plan or not, but that was in between the New and Old Testament, so you don't have to read about it. <laughs> Thank God. Let's think of the second thing, that God's provision can be a person. God's provision can be a person. He sent Joseph before them, before there was ever a famine. Joseph was in Egypt for years as a slave. He was in prison, but he was there. He was God's key man at the time. Sometimes God's provision comes from people. Now, that doesn't mean that we're supposed to live off of people, amen. We're not supposed to, every time something happens, we turn around and ask Grandma for a loan. That's what I'm talking about. But sometimes God 
uses people. He may use someone to speak a word to you that is in season, something that's going to encourage you and lift you up. He may have, he may have someone who's going to come along and help you at just the right time. He may have someone who has a pickup truck that's going to help someone move. How many of you got pickup trucks? Several of you got pickup trucks. That's good because we've got some people. David's going to be getting in touch with you later. <laughs> He's got some stuff he needs to get moved. Hallelujah. But, uh, you know, you get the word encouragement as something. He was sent before the famine. God knew ahead of time this was going to happen. He put it on the land. He had a man. Hallelujah. God's got a plan. It may involve a person. Now, it may not. Sometimes what we get, we receive directly from God, and sometimes it comes from the boss, and sometimes it comes from this and that. The, the check you didn't know you were going to get in the mail, the refund for something you didn't know you had coming, and, you know, just different things. It's not always material, uh, but God does meet our needs, and he does bless us, and he does pour stuff out. John Muratori says that often our prayers are not answered the way we think. We pray for a harvest, and God gives us a seed. Think about that. You know, we're praying for these things. We want this stuff to happen. We want this to happen. And then uh, when it doesn't seem like it's happening that way, later on down the road, we, we, you know, there, at that time we're feeling like, oh, this is, I don't know why this isn't going right. And then down the road we figure out it all worked out, and it was a little bit different than what we thought. Sometimes what we think is not what it's going to be. His answer to our prayers may not be exactly what we think it ought to be. I'm praying for a specific car, and I want it to be a specific color, and I want it to have this, this, and this, and I end up with a car that's almost that, but it's not that, and I feel like bummed out a little bit. You know, I'm glad I got a new car, but it wasn't this, you know, and then you find out, you know, down the road that that car has a recall on it, and you would have been driving around something that had been a lemon with bad brakes or something. You know, it's things that you don't think about at the time, that's why we have to keep the right attitude. Because when you're going through stuff, the end result is what's going to be uh, the thing that shows us that God's hand was in it. It's not always what's happening right at that moment. Now, I'd like to know that everything that happens is God, but I don't always recognize it. Now, that might be my, my fault, but usually it's because I'm not paying attention. Amen. Hallelujah. The third thing I want us to see here is that being sent isn't always easy. You know, Joseph didn't have it easy. Joseph ended up in, I mean, he was a slave. He got lied about. He ended up in prison. Nothing, nothing fun about that, nothing glorious about that. People, people sometimes pray for the best, biggest ministry. They want to go and do this and that. They don't understand the, the sacrifice and the things that happen. And if we look at the early pioneers of uh, Christianity going throughout the world, and even today there are martyrs in different countries uh, that are giving their lives for the gospel. There are uh, the early days of the Pentecostal message in the early 1900s. They were run out of town and feathered and all kinds of things because it didn't line up with somebody else's doctrine. You know, sometimes we suffer a little bit. John chapter 8, verse number 12 says, And Jesus spoke to them, saying again, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, when I read that, I think, well, then nothing bad should happen. But that's not really what it's saying. When it talks about walking in darkness, it's talking about walking in sin, that making provision for sin and ending up on, on the wrong road. Uh, but we're going to be people who carry the light. Amen? But the Bible also tells us, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, think about it. I don't, for some reason, I don't know about you, but I don't think that the valley of the shadow of death sounds like a real place I want to go. Amen? I was talking to somebody the other day, and this was hilarious. And uh, it was all people in ministry, and uh, we were talking about hot sauce. How I many like hot sauce? All right. And they were talking about how, boy, they got some that, you know, is hotter than hell. That's the name of it. And uh, the, these were ministers, so, you know, of course, I was just listening. But, <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, so someone was saying, yeah, this is so hot, man. It gives you a taste of what hell is going to be like. And this one person said, well, I don't want to know about it till I get there. <laughs> we're like, uh, what? <laughs> uh, we're hoping that you don't go there. Hey, Ben. And then it was like, oh. 
I hope nobody goes there. I think somebody is, but I hope, I hope they don't. Amen? Well, hallelujah. The valley of the shadow of death. I don't want to go there either. That's close enough to hell for me, and I don't want to go. But if I'm there, I'm not supposed to fear evil. Because I know there's that must be an exit. There's got to be another side. There's got to be something to get out of it. I'm not going to stay there. Amen? Joseph. Man, he had big dreams. God gave him dreams. These just wasn't things he puffed up and thought about. He had dreams. And it says that while he was in this thing, he was in fetters. His feet were in irons. And his dreams tested him. 2 Corinthians 2.4 says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth. Sometimes we are grieved. Sometimes we weep and we are sad over things that we don't understand and we have a broken heart over something. We don't know why God isn't answering. We don't know why this isn't happening. We don't know why so-and-so didn't get healed. We don't know why this didn't change. We don't know why we lost the best job we ever had and ended up having to go somewhere else. And, you know, all these questions that we have sometimes, it's the end thing that we have to look at. You could be in Joseph's prison. You could be in Joseph's slavery. You could be in irons right now. But what you've got to think about is what's the end result. It's elevation. It's bringing up. It's bringing back. It's, it's if we continue to trust in God, we get to that place that we believe God's saying where to go. We end up there. Even if you take a detour through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, if I see that on a sign, I'm on the interstate, I'm not getting off. But what if my car breaks down? What if I'm starting to have trouble and I have to get off on the valley of shadow of death exit? I think that's in Kentucky down. I'm thinking. Make sure you take that and tell Jason about that when you get a chance. Him and David are both missing today. We don't have our Kentuckians there. I should have said Texas, but how are that? Oh, there is, huh? Okay. Well, I know, I know one time there was a Texan that was in California, and uh, he, he was uh, wanting to make a, a, a call and reverse the charges, and uh, the lady told him, the operator told him what it was. He says, my God, in Texas, I could call hell and it wouldn't cost that much. <laughs> and she said, well, sir, in Texas, that's not a long-distance call. Anyway, you know, if the Apostle Paul loved the people at Corinth abundantly, how much does God love us? He loves us abundantly. He loves us with abundance. And that, that actually is an interesting word there because it means basically uh, something done or possessed in a greater degree exceedingly Superfluidity. Everybody write that one down if you know how to spell it. Abundance. God has abundance for us. There was an abundance in Egypt, but there was an abundance in Egypt because someone listened to God and did something beforehand. Someone took the seed that was being prepared for the harvest and did something with it. Amen. You know, I knew a man one time, his dad would always get these words from God about what was going to happen in the uh, farm market, and he would know what soybean futures was going to be, and he knew what, I mean, every year he'd tell him, he'd tell his family, yeah, you know, it's going it's to be high this year, and they're going to have this this year, and he never planted any of it, and he never did anything with it, and he never invested in anything, and how much did they end up with when Nothing. You got to take what God's given you and do something with it sometimes. Amen. Another thing to think about is timing. It said that until the time that his word came to pass. How do you know sometimes we have to wait? We sing all those great songs about waiting on God, and it's not the thing we really want to do. Amen. 
I mean, we're really not all that into waiting, are we? No, we're not. I get in line at some store, I guarantee you it's going to be the slow line. Don't get behind me. I've taken to when I go to Kroger's now, I check myself out. I don't mean in the mirror like some of you. I just, I mean, you know, if I've got a small amount of stuff, I go over, beep, 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 and I'm gone. I'm gone before because I'm going to be faster than most of the cashiers. And I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm trying to read these things and push buttons and stuff. Now, if I've got a big boatload of stuff, you know, I let Cheryl take it, and I go out and sit in the car. No, I, <laughs> that's not true. Hallelujah. <laughs> Don't judge me. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 5, it says that we're not to judge anything before the time until the Lord comes. So when the Lord comes, then you'll know whether or not what I said was just kidding around, which it was. Yeah. We have a timing on things. It's not our timing. We don't choose the timing uh, when God, when Jesus is coming back, you know, he said it's not for us to know the times or the seasons in the Father's hands. Some things you just don't know. I don't know that I... Well, let's put it this way. I don't know the date of my death. I'm kind of glad about that in one way because, I mean, the last couple of weeks would be nerve-wracking, wouldn't they? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know, don't get on death row. Uh, it's... Although you still wouldn't know because you got so many appeals, but never mind. Different, different soapbox. <clears throat> Paul, when he wanted to go preach at some place, he couldn't go. He wanted to go to this other place. He couldn't go. Finally, he has a dream about a guy in Macedonia saying, hey, come over here. And he knows that's where God wants him to go. It was a timing thing. He had to go there, not these other places. You know, some of the places you may go, some of the things you may do, you may be supposed to be doing it now, but maybe it's later. Sometimes you feel like you're supposed to go, and sometimes you feel like you're supposed to stay. There's a song in here, and I'll sing it to you some other time. The last thing, God's word will test us. There's been things probably that God, you feel like God spoke to your heart, things that were going to happen. Maybe it's a loved one that's supposed to get saved, and they haven't. Maybe it's uh, some promotion, and they gave it to somebody else, but you still feel like you should have had it. Well, maybe you'll get it. Amen? Maybe they're going to pave the way and... And it's going to be better by the time you get there. I remember I, there, there, there's all kinds of things that we look at. Uh, we feel like God has said to us and it hasn't come to pass. And it, and it tests us. It says that the word of the Lord tested him. Now, he was in irons. His feet was in irons. He was, he was not a happy camper. He was in a bad spot. Prison back in those days didn't have color TV. Nothing of that. Oh, that's right, DJ. They didn't exist. Hallelujah. So there you are, in irons. But what's bothering you isn't what's got you held there. It's what hasn't happened in your life. Amen? It's what hasn't come to pass. It's that thing you've been believing for, but it hadn't happened. It's that thing that, that uh, God spoke to you, and you know that's what it was. You knew it was him. And then when it doesn't come to pass, you start doubting a little bit, don't you? You start thinking, ah, maybe, I, maybe it was that dill pickle I ate. You know, maybe it was something else that got a hold of me. I, you know, maybe I was listening to a lie from the enemy because he lied to me that God wanted to prosper me and give me good things. How I many know oh, the devil ain't going to lie to you about that, amen? The devil's one lying to you when you're in the waiting period saying, yeah, you wasn't supposed to get that. Yeah, that isn't going to come to pass. That's when he speaks. Let me say to you today, hope deferred makes the heart sick. That's what it says in Proverbs 13, 12. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Hope deferred. When we're believing for something and it doesn't happen, we can give in to a sickness of the heart. The problem is some people stay there and they give up on their dreams 
And that seed that they gave and the things that they had planted and the things that they had been doing, they quit watering and they quit believing for it and they let it lay fallow. And that it doesn't come to pass because anything that they were supposed to do in that meantime didn't happen. What if Joseph said, well, I ain't going to give Pharaoh no. I gave those two guys interpretations of their dreams. didn't help me at all. I'm not going to give Pharaoh no interpretation of his dream. Well, he'd stayed where he was or lost his head. What if his brothers hadn't thrown him in a pit and sold him? Because later on, Joseph tells them it was God's will that this happened. Ooh. So if you want to sell one of your children, it won't be God's will. I can tell you that. Sometimes we feel bad it isn't here yet, but when it comes, when it comes, but when the desire comes, doesn't say if, amen? It doesn't say if it happens, when it happens. You've got to hang on to what your dream is. You've got to hang on to what the hope you have in your heart is. You've got to hang on to what that is that you feel God said to you. You can't give up on things like that. Hold on to it. Believe for it. So the knothead you're believing for hasn't got saved yet. They will. Hallelujah. Now, they have a will of their own, and sometimes they don't answer. But in most other arenas, if we're believing for something and we feel like it's from God, we can have it. Amen. We just have to keep sowing the seeds. It's like our worship team to come back. I just almost thought about grabbing a piece of that bread and chewing on it for a little bit, but then, hallelujah, I wouldn't have been able to finish talking. Nope. (laughs) One comedian in a church is enough, Jeff. Hallelujah. Yeah. He's Jerry Lewis. I think I'm the straight guy. I'm Dean Martin. He's Jerry always heckled out of the crowd. I know you've already laid your Bible to the side and put your ink pen up because you was taking copious notes. You may be here this morning and say, Pastor, I may not be in the valley of the shadow of death but I'm in a suburb I'm close things just haven't turned out like I thought they would maybe your hope's been deferred it's been laid back it hasn't come to pass your dream hasn't happened yet if it's a dream from God it's going to and when it comes it's going to be a tree of life Hallelujah. In the Bible, there's a tree of life. It's in the Garden of Eden. There's also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And even though I know we don't really have access to that, sometimes we tend to go for that other tree. We don't keep our eye on the prize. I'd like everybody to stand. Why don't you bow your head? If you're here today and you can say, Pastor, I know what you're talking about. What I've been believing for hasn't happened yet. I'm getting tired. I'm getting weary. The word of the Lord is testing me. Well, know this. It's only a test. It's not the final result. It's not the end score. It's just a test. Pass the test. Sometimes we need strength to do that. 
If you're here and you can say, Pastor, you're talking about me, lift up your hand this morning. Yep, hands going up all over. Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus for every one of these people that raised their hands. I thank you, Father, that they'll not lack for any good thing, that the things they've been believing for, the dreams that they have that haven't come to pass, Lord, you haven't forgot about them. You haven't forgot about the dreams. You haven't given up on them, and I pray they not give up on you. I pray that a supernatural strength would be imparted to them. Tell you what I'd like you to do. Come to this altar. I don't know that I'm going to lay hands on you, but what you're saying is, God, I haven't given up. I'm not giving up. Just come to the altar. Hallelujah. What are we seeing this morning? A lot of people with dreams, a lot of people with goals and visions, a lot of people who want God's hand to move. And all of us are saying, now, Lord, now. But understand, it's going to be in his time. He's made a provision. If what you want is from God, it's already provided. Father, I praise you and I thank you for every person who came here. And I thank you, Lord, that they will not miss out on one thing that you have for them through weariness that the hope that's deferred will not cause them to stray nor to give up hope but Lord what I pray is that today they would be strengthened within their inner man that they would be given the fortitude and the spiritual power given the the willpower to be able to continue believing for it even when they haven't seen it happen And I thank you, Father, that whatever it may be that they desire, whatever you've laid on their heart, it is a sure word if it's a word from you. And I thank you, Father, it will happen. I pray especially for those, Lord, who are here because they're believing for a loved one to be saved, for a family member or a friend or spouse, perhaps, child. Lord, I especially pray strength for them today. And I pray that every one of those unsaved loved ones would hear the gospel multiple times and have opportunities galore to be able to respond because we want to see them saved. We know they have a will, Lord, but we pray that you intervene in the circumstances of their lives to draw their attention to you. You bring people into their lives that will minister to them. And we thank you for it. Father, those who are believing for a difference in in their employment or in their financial status, Father. I pray that this would come to pass and that the doors would be open. Those who are believing for a healing, Lord, they've been believing for something. I thank you. Maybe even believing for somebody else's healing. I thank you, Lord, that it come to pass. Those who are believing for children, I pray, Father, it come to pass. I thank you, Lord, that if we have been given a seed, that every person here will take what has been given to them and they'll plant it and they'll water it, even if all they have is a seed of hope. I pray, Father, that it bring forth fruit in the name of Jesus. I thank you for it, Lord. And I give you all the glory, Father. I thank you that whatever their need may be, whatever their dream is, I pray, Father, for fruition. I pray for that abundance we heard about, superfluidity, whatever that may be. Let it flow. Let it come. Let it touch them. Let it be theirs. We claim it today. I want you to say this. Heavenly Father, I believe that the dream that you've given me is from you. If it's from you, it will come to pass. And I speak to my hope that it would be strengthened, that I would not waver, 
but I would stand in faith. And I thank you today that my hope is sure, my dream is real, and it will come to pass. In Jesus' name, amen.